All right. So thanks for joining us on this uh, early, early morning for the coffee presentation. Uh, we want to do some question and answer. Uh, I'll, you guys should have reviewed all the, uh, the I got on the website, simplepassivecashflow.com backslash coffee. I had the little fun video on there um, of my trip earlier this year. I went down there finally. I bought my parcel, I think, uh, late last year or mid last year. Can't remember. Um, me and David did a webinar. That's the this thing up here that you guys can review later, um, and then a bunch of other tidbits of information that I got I put on here again. The simple passive cash flow backslash coffee. But the purpose of today's call is mainly to just go over questions that you guys had. Um, I'll kind of, I've got a few of them that other people have emailed me that couldn't make it and we'll kind of run through those quickly. But, you know, as we, we go along through this, um, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask some questions and why don't you introduce uh, the one and only Mr. Darren. Good morning. Calling from uh, Panama or, or Belize this morning? Panama City, Panama from our new office. Just moved a couple of days ago. So the first question here, Darren, and maybe this will help uh, clear up Get exactly. What, what do you do at uh, at the coffee farms here? Is you know, what's the succession plan when uh, David steps down, or if he ever does, or if you do? And how can we be assured the high quality management of the parcel goes on long term? Okay, I think there's is there some is there one person unmuted? There's some background noise there. Oh, I can take care of that. Yeah. Okay, so the succession planning is a big question that was very important to me and David, and is obviously a big question for a lot of people. When we got this question two and three years ago, it was it was tougher to answer because it was me and David, and then everyone else was involved in the farming side of things. So there was everything from the investment side of things was run by me and David. I was and still am the only salesperson, if you like, even though maybe only 20% of our time is spent on sales. David was in charge of getting the investment structured and building the company. But because all of the farms that we bought, as you know, most of them are either very little pr production of coffee or else raw land, we couldn't overload the, the company with a load of staff when there was no cash flow coming from the product. So we purposely, purposely kept our team very tight, kept building out the farming team. So we added agronomists, biologists, every new farm, we added new farm workers, but it was always just me and David that were running everything behind the scenes. Now we're at a stage where we've got a kind of a corporate structure in place. So we've got Andres, who's director of agriculture. He looks out through everything on the farming level in Panama and Belize. He has his team underneath him. He has an agronom two agronomists, a biologist, farm foreman, and about 45 staff. So as you can imagine, me and David don't really get involved in what he does in the farms on a day-to-day. -day. He's he, They're the experts. They're the coffee experts. If me and David suddenly went away, those guys are still keep doing what they're doing. We've got a VP of operations. She's got her team of what we call bean counters underneath her. They've got the accountants, the bookkeepers. They look after all the logistics, make sure all the bills are paid. We've got the new office. I don't know if you can see much behind us here, where we're building our, our sales and marketing team. The, it's the next stage of our growth. It's not really going to be to sell parcels. That just kind of ticks along by itself. This is for the next stage. This is for selling coffee and for selling chocolate. So David right now is in... He was in Prague. I think he's in Austria now, meeting with some industry players for distribution of our products into Europe and then also into the US. And we've just hired a new gentleman from Bolivia who's starting in a couple of weeks, who is an experienced executive who has done origin to like sourcing the origin, finding the market, identifying the market, and actually delivering the products. And he's done it for products for coffee and cacao out of South America before. So that's the next growth stage. So as you can see, it's all starting to come together. Three years ago, it was me and David and we were selling parcels. Now we've got 102 staff across two countries, five locations, speaking two languages, which is challenging. Um, and there's a real depth to the team that there wasn't, quite honestly, three years ago. So David always said in his military way of speaking that I was only ever one bullet away from a promotion. So <laughs> everybody in the company is always training the people underneath them. 
I've got people underneath here that have been trained underneath me. I'm training to, to do what David does. Andres has his people underneath him. We f fully believe that we've got the best people in, in the positions that we have. But the other thing, if, okay, worst case scenario, say something happened to Andres. Andres, we firmly believe, is the best person in Bocchetti to do what he does with his coffee. But there's 10 other really, really successful coffee companies, and they all have their own Andres. So if, like if you're going to go into worst case scenarios, if we had to replace them, there's a good work pool in both Panama and Belize where we could replace vital key members if we had to. And the idea is not about if David retires or if something happens to David. David will be retiring from the day to day. He'll always keep a 30,000 view level of, of organizing everything. But we're already at the stage now where the farming people, they know what they're doing. We sign off on the checks. We have the regular meetings. We keep everyone in tow. But you'd be worried if it was me and David making coffee decisions or chocolate decisions. So the corporate structure is now in place. Team is in place. We have that depth um, that if anything happens to any one person, that the company survives. So we referenced Andres. Um, again, you don't want Darren telling the workers what to do. That's that gentleman. No. <laughs> <laughs> gentleman right there. He's kind of the, the coffee brains behind it all, the operations, the, C, the CEO, if you will. Yeah, so he's the, I suppose, the director of agriculture, really, in the company. He's born and bred in Bocchetti. Well, so one important thing, in both companies, so International Coffee Farms is a separate company. It's Panamanian. It's registered here. 90, 96, 97% of our staff are Panamanian. And most of the people in Bocchetti are born and bred in Bocchetti. So like they're not going anywhere. Uh, same in Belize. All the staff over there are all Belizean. I don't think we have one. Yeah, they're all Belizean. And they're all in their hometowns. So it's not like they're suddenly going to up sticks and move away. All right. Next question here. Um, how big do you guys expect to grow the portfolio? And how many farms do you guys currently have today? So when we started looking at this in 2014, we had a target of 250 hectares um, in Boquete. Um, so multiply that by 2.5 for your acres. We're currently at 144 hectares, um, closing on these farms that we're closing on now. 250 is probably still a realistic goal because it's going to come to a stage where we're probably going to hit a limit of available land at a right price. Um, but if the right farms come along at the right price with the right conditions, we'll keep going. But there's no magic. 250 was kind of the number of hectares to give us the, quality, the quantity of coffee we needed to be a, a player, if you, if you will. If you're talking to, let's give an example now, we've got about 30 to 35,000 pounds of excellent coffee. But if I go to a buyer in Korea, there's no point talking to them. We don't have enough coffee to send container loads over to Korea. So 250 hectares at full production will give us the, the magic number that we were looking at volume-wise. So if we stop at that and we never sell another parcel and we just go to coffee trade shows and cacao trade shows, then we're happy. But if, if the right farm comes along after that, then yeah, we'll look at it. Belize, we've just started. Belize, we've got three farms. Actually, we just bought one. We've got four farms. 104 plus 30, so 134 acres over there. We could probably do another four or five years of buying farms over there. We could get to four or five hundred acres easy, I'd say, over there. Is it the 250? Is the 250 on the on the chocolate side the same goal? No, cock. The chocolate's going to be a little bit different. The amount of cacao trees you get per acre is different, and the amount of production per tree is a little bit different. So. Uh, and there's a lot more land. There's, there's, there's tons of land in Belize. In Panama, there's very specific requirements for us to buy a farm. Has to have the right microclimate, has to have the right soil, has to be between about 14, 1500 meters and 2000 square meters above sea level before we leave and consider it. And then you have to look at access, we spent quite a lot of money putting roads into the farms recently. And then the seller, a lot of Panamanian coffee's big news at the moment. It's selling for four or five, six hundred dollars a pound at auction. So all the people with their rundown farms suddenly think their farm is worth a million dollars. So some reality checks needed there. All right. So we're looking at this, uh, this parcel map of where mine happens to be. So this, you buy, this, you, this is the one acquisition you guys have done in the past. How many right. do you, what what I, farm are you in? Oh, I don't know. If you said oh, the name, I would probably remember it. Jaramillo? Jaramillo 1? No, I think it starts with A. Was okay. one of the higher ones? 
I'll have to have a look. But how many acres is this? Let me have a look. Depends on depends on which farm. The average farms are about. Oh, here we go. This one's eleven hectares. Scroll again on a little bit. This is an this is an eleven hectare farm. On average, the the very first farm we bought was three point two hectares. Very small. Next one was I think eight. Next one was seven. Next one was eight. A couple of sixes. And we very, very intentionally bought small farms that we could wrap our arms around because we were growing the team. We didn't want to suddenly buy a 120 hectare farm and need to have to hire, you need one worker for every three hectares. So we didn't want to have to go out and hire 40 people on the spot and train them all at the same time. So we grew incrementally, but now we are buying bigger farms. We bought a, an eight hectare, then a 12, then a 14, then a 16. And then this one's going to be a 40 done in stages by the time we get it done. So. It's getting bigger and bigger. Two two farms might get us now and up into two fifty, um, or we could still buy another four or five hectares. It just depends on the farms that come available. Okay, so I mean, just to give folks like the sense of you know the reason why it's not available because people bought them all, but then you know this kind of kind of size comes online, and then now we've got some for the time being. <clears throat> Yeah, so I'll give you um, a rundown of the process of what goes through buying a coffee farm here. And it's a good time because we're just buying this new farm. So we go out, we've been, we have a very good realtor. I don't know if you can see the Remax logo behind us, but we own a couple of Remax franchises down here. And we have a Remax realtor that works, a broker that works solely for us. And he's identified all of our farms. So he knows the criteria. He doesn't bring a farm to us unless it meets all the criteria. Then Andres will look at it. We'll get our lawyer to look up the Finca number, make sure there's no liens against the property, make sure it's free and clear, all that kind of stuff. If it meets the conditions, we'll make an offer, come to an agreement. Um, usually the title and the plan that they have for their farm is anything up to 100 years old. So we'll re-verify it and we'll do the outer line that you just showed there um, to re-survey re the whole farm to make sure it is the size they said it was going to be. They then have a lot of homework to do to get a new... Um, plan created in the Registro Publico. We sign it. Once our lawyer is happy, everything's good. We sign it. We pay a deposit and we've got term sheets and we take over immediate possession of the farm. We then get the surveyor to go in and he starts doing these subdivisions. So you can see the amount of details. Each one of these boxes, um, it's not just four points. There's a load of detail for every single acre, every single parcel. So we get that done, we submit it to the municipality, usually we sit on it for about five or six weeks, send up with some changes, we go back and forth, and in about three months, four months, we'll have a final accepted subdivision of the farm. We then can do into the allocation, so we'll email, every, we allocate everybody in the order of date funded into the farm, we then email you a copy of this with the deed creation contract. This is the piece of paper that actually shows this heck, this parcel, by these GPS coordinates has been transferred from ICFC to you, has all the legal documentation lick stamped. We send that to you. You guys print it out on legal size paper, sign it, mail it back to us here in Panama because we need the wet signature using our DHL account. So no cost to you guys on that. Once we gather all that paperwork, that process takes another two or three months. We then submit all of that into the notary. And then they probably take about six months then to create the actual deed. So that's why there's about a year timeline from the time someone comes in to get in the deed. So that's one of the most common questions we get is the timeline for getting the deed. And that's why it takes time to create it. All right. Well, uh, I think the next question here is the, one of the first questions I had, you know, with this purchase being in Panama, not in the United States. Uh, maybe let's talk to you about um, how do we know if the purchase of this land qualifies you to citizens? Um, friendly nations permanent resident visa yeah so that's it's kind of a bit of a misconception there is I have a friendly nations visa here I think I showed you when we were here you don't need to invest in anything to get a friendly nations visa you can get a residency here it's just like a Panamanian has a big E on it to say you're an extra hero but just being from the United States or being from any of the friendly nation countries listed you qualify you don't need to invest there are a couple of companies who have been using, probably a bit sneakily, have been using this Friendly Nations visa for, as a means of selling their real estate. But it's, we, we don't do it. It's, it's quite sneaky. So all you need to do, if you're interested, 
Law Friendly Nations visa online. Everything's there. Government has their own pages. Um, you either need to set up a corporation here in Panama or you need to have a job, either one of them. Even if you set up a corporation, you don't need to capitalize it. The whole corporation, legal fees, the whole procedure costs you about $5,000. You put $5,000 in the bank and leave it there. That's your proof of funds for them. You'll need to do two or three trips to Panama. You'll open a bank account for your corporation, um, maybe on your second trip. And then on your third trip, you get one of those cards and it's permanent residency. You only need to come to Panama once every two years to keep it active. So that's a long answer to your question. You can get a friendly nations visa without investing. So the, uh, owning a half acre parcel, it's not a reason. It shouldn't be one of your reasons for buying a parcel because you actually don't need it. Yeah, and, and if you guys are interested in getting a second passport and doing that stuff, I would recommend um, Googling Sovereign Man. Yep. Kind of a neat sheet. I personally am not into that type of stuff. I've got other things to spend my time on. Yeah, Simon has a Simon has a good team down here. Simon Black has a good team of lawyers down here, and it's, he has it all turnkey. So, if you listen to Simon, if you read his newsletters or, or subscribe to his members area, the I'm not, are you in, are you in the private section lane? I haven't signed up for it. No, no, a, no, no. He has a team down here that'll hold your hand and walk you through it. He, his fees might be a little bit higher, but it's turnkey. So. Right, but as far as just buying the parcels, no, no, no it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a consideration. We could. I could easily wrap up this with a lawyer and use it as an angle to sell more parcels, but <clears throat> we don't want to get into all that. We just stick to doing what we're doing. All right. Um, so any concern on the legal side in terms of liability with the foreign workers suing landowners, workplace injuries, et cetera? Um, we get the, so we've got clients from, I'd say maybe 70% of our clients are from the US, the rest are from Europe, Asia, some from the Middle East. And this question only ever comes up when we're talking to people from the U.S. It, it's, a, it's an important factor for you guys if you own real estate in the U.S. It's a fairly litigious society and you have to have yourself protected because people will sue you. That doesn't really exist down here. But saying that, um, you guys as parcel owners have no liability. The company has full liability. All of our workers um, have Social Security and all the benefits down here, with, which here actually means something, which means they get full medical and all that kind of stuff. And just to be double sure, because anytime you're dealing with other people's money, you always have to be extra careful. Every single person that sets foot on any of our properties signs a liability release waiver, whether that's someone coming on to take a drone footage, whether, Lane, you signed it when you came on the tour, um, if it's a coffee roaster coming on. So there's no chance of anybody coming on and, and slipping and, and, and suing you guys. Now, this might be a, a question for the lawyer, but so when people sign up, are they essentially like limited partners? Or? No, it's, no, it's very specifically structured the way it is that it's a real estate transaction. So you're buying a piece of real estate and then you opt in for us to manage it for you. And that's for a few reasons. It's because we're not keeping us clean with the SEC. So we're not selling the security and to keep things straightforward like that. So it's a straight up real estate purchase. You buy the land, transfer ownership to you. You opt in for us to manage it as part of our existing portfolio. So we're not, we're not in the business of just managing other people's farms. We maintain a lot of the land in every farm that we buy. All the farm, so I'll give you an example. La India was a 22 hectare farm. 16 hectares was plantable in coffee. So the six hectares that was not we kept some of that was forest some of it was used for workers accommodation roads all the different things and then of the 16 hectares that were plantable we kept i think four or five hectares for ourselves so we're in this to be in the coffee business not just in the parcel selling business all right and uh, if you guys got questions you guys can type them into the chat window and and just just to confirm justin you don't need uh this friendly nation visa to invest some people like to do it so they can get dual citizenship, kind of their angle. But you know, we're not. It's, it seems to be a. It's a very common question. Having having a second residency, I think, is a good option. Having a plan B, if just it's it's no harm to have. If you can have a corporation in Panama that has a bank account attached to it, and you have an ID that you can get in and out of a country and come and work here if if you want, it doesn't hurt. You're not going to be worse off with it. But I get people on the phone to talk about giving up their U.S. passport, and I think that's a very drastic measure. So another question here, um, you know, so my website, I've kind of said, you know, cash flow is like 15 to 18 months. 
um, other people who have seen other things where it's a little bit sooner. I think I just put 15 and 18 months just to under promise over deliver that kind of yeah, thing. But, but I, yeah, but I think that was on our, that was on our previous farm. That was right. on, we've all, we've always had the two farm types There's a producing farm and a raw land farm. So everything that's in the members area is the current offering. So sometimes the, the website and the FAQs can be a bit generic because we've, we have producing farms and they sell out and we've raw land farms and they sell out and we're maybe not as up to date as we could be on, on changing the text every few months. But in the members area, the, the financial projections are always up, they're always current. So at the moment, it's a raw land farm. The raw land farms are cheaper than the producing farms for us to acquire and, to, and for the parcels. Um, and by definition, it's a raw land farm. So there's no coffee we have. So this farm we're buying now, the saplings are in the nursery. There's 77,000 saplings in the nursery doing their thing. Rainy season comes in around May. We plant the farm and it takes a coffee tree or a sapling three years to produce its first crop. In, once that first crop is there, <clears throat> excuse me, we harvest it, process it, rest it, and then market and sell it and get paid for it. So that's why the cash flow is in year four. So for the first three years, if there's no coffee to sell, there's nothing to generate revenue. So that's what the cash flow year four. Yeah, and you know, people will probably ask, well, why don't I go get the producing one? Well, not only is it more expensive, but I mean, the, the theory is like you guys have like the science. I mean, you guys got like a, a worm lady to kind of grow this stuff, right? <laughs> like, I mean, when you inherit it from like a, just a random <clears throat> Panamanian dude, not using the quite the best technology and you're kind of inheriting that. So th that was one reason why I went with the bare land one, which is this one. And the second was, well, that's all I had in my self-directed HSA. So that taught yeah, me out. I think, <laughs> I think I remember you were thinking you were talking to Andres about this. When we started, we were buying what we call producing farms. So that means that it has coffee trees on it and the trees have coffee. But if the seller was in his seventies, and he had, his kids don't want to live in Boquete, it's a small town, 25,000 people. They want to live in Panama City or they're in the US. The family doesn't want, our generation just doesn't want to work the land. They want to be off in San Francisco doing cooler stuff than that. So he didn't have any inclination, any motivation to uptake, upkeep his farm. So his trees got old. Some of them have coffee trees that are 25, 30 years old and they're well past their peak and the volume is just, is low. So we needed coffee to be in the business at the start because, again, we're in the coffee business. But all the farms we're buying recently are all raw lands because, Andre, like you said, if you're inheriting three generations of bad farming practices, we wouldn't buy it unless we knew we could fix it. But buying the raw land farm makes it so much easier. We can just engineer the farm. You're an engineer, right? You can engineer the farm from scratch. This, is, this part of the farm is better suited to this varietal of coffee because it gets sun first thing in the morning. This part of the farm is up on the on the top of the uh, the hill, so it gets strong wind, so it can't have geisha because the root system isn't strong enough. So we have to use pacamara. So you can you can scientifically choose which coffee varietals you want to put in which parts of the farm. If you need to put in irrigation, treating the soil, but it's like a blank canvas. You can design it from scratch. So you're at the at the end of the day, yeah, it should, it should be easier, and it gives you it gives you a good starting point. Hey Justin, you want to take yourself off mute and? your questions hey uh my question was around the payouts of it uh how's it work so it sounds like the first couple of years you're building it out do you get paid out on your specific parcel or is it a payout on that um, that farm or is it a payout over the all of the farms together so it's on the it's on it's farm by farm so if you have a look at the, the farm that's on the screen there that Lane has, his parcel is right there in the middle of the farm. So if we were doing a parcel by parcel, first of all, imagine the administrative nightmare that would be to just try and do it. It's not going to work. Plus, nobody, nobody would want the parcel at the bottom. Everyone wants the parcel at the top. But everything is pooled. All the expenses and the revenues is pooled across each farm. Now, there have been times where you've bought two farms in the same year that are close to each other and we'll operate them as one farm because it just it makes sense for economies of scale. But we're not, if we were to operate all the farms together, imagine the owners that are in our first farm from 2015 and they're just now getting into their third year of their third distributions coming out next week. They're going to be getting to see some decent numbers. If we kept dragging it down by bringing in new farms, it's just not fair. So farm by farm, 
except on a basis where we acquire the farms that are close to each other at the same time and are planted at the same time, then we could operate them together just because it would make sense. But yeah, it's pooled across. It, if we had to cut down the trees, say on your specific parcel, because we're rotating the trees or if we had to use extra fertilizer, it's not going to affect your outcome. So it's all pooled. Got it. And then in terms of overhead, you're splitting that across all farms? Yeah. So you'll see the direct operating expenses of each farm will be calculated. We have got <laughs> spreadsheets like you wouldn't believe. Every farm, the direct operating expenses going into that farm. So when this farm is in full production, we'll go back a little bit. The first few years until the farm is fully producing, the cost of do, of of maintaining that farm, planting the farm and running it until it's producing is in your parcel price. So when you're paying 18,000 for a parcel, it's not that the land is worth $9 a square meter. It's about a third of that. The rest of the cost is turning that into a producing coffee farm. Then once it's fully producing, it operates like an independent entity. You produce the coffee, you sell it, take away the direct operating expenses, and you're left with the profit, and then it's split 80-20 between you guys and us. Perfect. And then just uh, in terms of the coffee and cacao, is it are they basically the similar returns? The percentages look pretty similar, even though the dollar amount is probably a bit different. Um, cacao is, depends which way you want to look at it. Coffee is a, is a simpler deal. It's whatever coffee is produced on the farm that Lane's parcel is in will be processed into green exportable coffee and sold. And that's, that's it. That's where it stops. Because green coffee sells for much higher multiples than raw cacao. If you're in cacao, We've got the farms that you're in that will produce our own cacao and it's going to be sold. We've got 204 Mayan farmers that we're buying cacao from. We buy it from them wet, bring it to our centralized processing depot, which is probably seen, and we then ferment and dry it. And then we can sell it as beans or we can process it into, we're building a, a processing facility now down in Punta Gorda, where we can process it into cacao liqueur, cacao butter, cacao powder, cacao nibs, and then actually and sell that wholesale to chocolate makers, bakers, people all over the world in that form as a semi-finished and finished product for obviously a higher margin than the beans. And then we also have the mahogany chocolate shop on Amberger's Key. I'm sure if, you're, if you guys are familiar with Mahogany Bay Village, but the chocolate shop sells finished products. So it sells truffles to guests in the hotel. And we've also launched two chocolate bars. We've got the Belizean I have some posters here I'll show you. We've got the Belizean Bar and the Brookdown, and both of them are on sale now in stores. They're going to be on the TV now in the next couple of weeks, and they're in the airport, so they're on sale for, for the general public in Belize. And you get to participate in the revenue streams of all of those, of the profits of all those revenue streams. So some people would see that as being more complicated and prefer coffee. Other people like the fact that there's multiple revenue streams, not just one. But the basis of getting in is you own a parcel in the land. Ownership of that parcel confers upon you the right to the profits of these other companies. If you sell your parcel in five years' time to somebody else, you're going to sell away your participation in Mahogany Chocolate to the new guy. So it's connected. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Cacao is a bit... Cacao, we're still learning with cacao. We're in our second year. Um, coffee, we're in our fifth year now. So the team is a lot more settled. We know the industry, but... We, we've been here we're just from experience we've been accepted belize has its challenges um belizean government central bank stuff like that um working with the mines getting around the mindset of all the belizean cacao farmers for the last well, forever have been funded by ngos by non-profit organizations so they're not used to being held accountable when it comes to being told to produce paperwork and where did that money go so we're getting there we've um the mahogany chocolate store opened a year late, so that it, or 11 months late, so that impacted our year one. So we're calling last year startup year, and this year is year one, um, and the numbers in the store and the bars and everything is uh, seeing what we predicted two years ago. And, and going back to, you know, the, you know, if you have the parcel at the tip or at the bottom, it doesn't matter if your particular parcel has the, the really nice geisha Plant, which some people will say it's not really better <laughs> it's more like tea but it, it doesn't matter if if as long as it's on the farm is what yeah, really matters exactly. um, so the whole idea you want to have so everybody keeps out so geisha sells for this huge price uh, but that, that's a little bit misleading as well that guy that sold his his geisha for 601 dollars a pound that was a 100 pound lot 
we're looking at having 500,000 pounds of coffee and then a million pounds of coffee in 2020. So you're never going to sell all your coffee for that amount. And not everybody in the world wants that coffee. So you have to have micro lots. In every farm, you're going to have four or five different varietals of coffee. And then each of those varietals of coffee can be processed three different ways. They can be natural, honeyed, and washed. So all of a sudden, you've got 15 different micro lots. And then you've got different microclimates within the farm. So you could have 30 micro lots. So it's not just a case of geisha is really famous. Let's plant all geisha. The market, there's not a big enough market for it. So that's why we plant all the different varietals. And, and you guys kind of sell it as like, you know, little micro blends to in the future. Yeah, exactly. Field. Yeah, we're going to st we'll start doing some farm blends, some espresso blends. The idea is next couple of years, for the, fir for the first while, we've been processing all our coffee, selling it through existing channels in, in Bocchetti where there was, they had unfulfilled orders. And we didn't have enough coffee really to do our own logistics yet. So we're selling it through them. But the idea now, next couple of years, is you'll have a roaster coming down to Panama. He'll do the same tour you did, Lane, um, only from a different angle. He'll be looking at the coffee. We'll show him the nursery, show him the farms, bring him into the storeroom and say, there's all our coffee. You take the samples of the coffee you want, bring it up to our lab, roast it to your specifications, and then test it in our equipment. And then the idea is he'll say, okay, next year I want 10,000 pounds of Pacamara washed from this farm. And I want 15,000 pounds of this coffee processed this way from this farm and it'll be processed to order instead of just processing all your coffee and saying who wants it it'll be done more strategically so some of you guys who own like timeshares in a hotel um, i think the way they do it is if you know unfortunately you might buy the part the the unit next to the elevator and nobody wants that one and you kind of get screwed over amongst the whole it's not like that it's kind of a pool amongst just this farm yeah, it's even, even across every farm. Yeah. Um, have any original investors sold or selling their parcels? We've had one guy who, well, there's two people. One guy, I gave him his money back. Um, he had funded, and after about three or four weeks, he called me up in a panic. Something to do with his family, we gave him his money back. And then there was one gentleman uh, from our very first year, Irish guy actually living in the US that was in financial difficulty and we just introduced him to one of our existing owners and they 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 set a price and he sold his parcels to him so but now apart from that nobody has looked to sell the reality is most of them are still inside the three-year no sale policy so nobody really could have sold but nobody has asked but most of it is down to the way we put people into the deal I've, I say no to people every single week because I think they're not in it for the long term or they're asking the wrong questions or they're just not a good fit because this really is, it's a long-term thing and we don't want people that are just going to be in and out because it's a low entry level. We don't want people that are going to be in and out. It's a waste of time. So, but no, to answer your question, that those two people, one, one money back and one sale in four or four years. All right. So one guy um, couldn't make it, purchased one late last year and hasn't received it his deeds. So I know this is a process you guys were kind of working on getting the deeds out to folks and yeah, this what's is what's the latest on that. This is for anybody who's getting into syndication or for anyone who's looking to do any deals. This is the reality. There is selling parcels is easy. Raising money is easy. Finding deals is not as easy, but you can do it. Delivery is where it all comes down to and things change. So we have, the systems here in Panama of how they issue the deeds, they, they did three things in the last, when we started first, we asked them that the 5% property transfer tax apply to the parcel operation. They said, no, we sold out three farms, four farms. And then they changed the law and said, okay, you owe us 5% property transfer tax on every parcel you've sold to date. Now we made a promise to our investors that there'd be no capital call, that there was no more money going to be needed from them. So we bit the bullet and we paid it. And that's why now you see on the agreements, it says purchase price plus 5% property transfer tax. Then in the last, really over the last 18 months, there's a lot of pressure on Panama from the US mainly, um, but know your client policies, anti-money laundering, Panama papers, Panama on the gray list, all that kind of stuff. So Panama have become very, very strict on who the end owner is. And even when money's coming in, they need to know who exactly this money is coming from. So to an extent where lawyers and realtors won't do escrow anymore down here because they're at risk. So 
the Panama decentralized the land deeding department from Panama to, to each region, which was a good idea, uh, but they did it before they had uh, the institutions set up in each region and that delayed everything by six months. Just recently, um, oh, about a year before that, they changed the paperwork process that we had to create this second document that had to be sent to you. Oh, that was it, sorry. They wanted each of our owners to come to Panama and meet the notary, which obviously wasn't gonna happen. So that's why we created the documents that we send to you that you sign and bring back to us that we can create the deed on your behalf. That set us back six months. And then as little as the new guy that they just put in power in the last, I think three or four months, hasn't had his paperwork signed to sign off on deeds. So that's, that's the reality. There's, there's stuff in the municipality where it's slow. There's rules that change and we just have to keep adapting to it. We are issuing deeds. There's deeds coming out. Um, it's just slow. And unfortunately, it's the only, it's the, apart from the weather, it's the only part of this that's out of our direct control. And that, that's just the reality of it. It's slow. One other change here, um, which Lane will be talking about with a few other people is, Due to the know your client policy now, they're becoming reluctant to deed parcels directly to self-directed IRAs or to any offshore entity that's not registered here in Panama. So there's two or three options. You can do what's called an assignment letter and we deed the parcel to you and you assign it to your IRA. I don't think that's gonna fly. You can have your offshore corporation registered here in Panama, which is possible, but it's probably gonna be a bit more expensive. The more realistic thing that was probably gonna happen is we're gonna to have to set up Panamanian corporations for each person, deed the parcels to that corporation, and then your IRA or your LLC will own all the shares in that corporation. So there's pluses and minuses to that. It gives you an offshore corporation here in Panama with a bank account attached to it and a lot of bonuses you can do for that, but it's gonna cost 1200 bucks. So like we did with the 5% transfer tax, we decided we're gonna pay that. And I think there's 67 clients that we're going to have to pay for Panamanian corporations for all of them so that we can fulfill our promise of getting the deeds issued. So that's the, that's one little thing that just came to light in the last three weeks. And that's the, that's the reality of it when you, when, when it comes to delivery. So when filing taxes, what sort of documentation do we get at the end of the year? 1099 K1, something like that. Yeah, well, we get this question all the time. They're all U S tax forms. So because we're a Panamanian company, we're, we abide by the laws of Panama. We don't issue tax. We don't have a presence in the U.S. We don't issue ta U.S. tax f tax forms or anything like that. So at the end of your year, when your farm is producing, you'll get a financial breakdown on the farm that you're in. It'll show the amount of coffee that was produced, what it was sold for, what the direct operating expenses were, what the splits were, and what your return is. And with all those numbers, you'll be able to make your own reporting. So it's up to you. Talk to a tax professional. Make sure you're. Some people think if they if they accrue the returns are if they don't take the distributions into the US so they don't have to report it, they do. And it's a, IRS will consider it an income regardless of whether you take it or not. Um, but again, I'm not here to give you US tax advice, talk to a professional, um, but we'll give you the numbers to do your own reporting, um, but we don't issue US tax forms because we're not a US company. So we, take care of, we take care of all your taxes in Panama and Belize. So you've got zero tax obligations, there's no business tax, no property tax, nothing like that here for you guys. But whether you're in the US, Europe, or Asia, or Dubai, you have your own tax responsibilities. So we'll give you the numbers, um, and then you'll have to make your own reporting. All right. I mean, the whole thing, no, only important things in the K-1 are anywhere are distributions and, and deductions. So it should be pretty easy. Yeah, and I think with the, the one of the best advantages for you guys of doing real estate in the US is all the tax benefits, both tax, tax and, and debt. But unfortunately, neither of them apply down here. It's 100% cash, 100% equity, 100% upfront. So you can't do a 1031 exchange. You can't leverage. You can't get a loan down here. And you don't get the deductions, unfortunately. So you get the diversification. You get the offshore side of things. You get the diversification outside the U.S. property market, all that kind of stuff. But you miss out on all the tax stuff. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's why I like using the self. If you got that self-directed IRA, or you got the four hundred one k money, or I use my self-directed HSA money, where you don't get the tax benefits. It is locked up in those. Yeah, so it's a good fit. Yeah, yeah. Um, moving on to more questions. Again, if you guys have more questions, type it in on the chat window, or just unmute yourself and and butt on in. But next question is um, biggest threats and risks. You know, like, I think we talked about like diseases when we were 
yep. who were there and you know how you're kind of using minimal um, pesticides there. Yeah, so like in all agriculture, pest and disease and all that is, is your biggest threat. So if, you, if you're looking at, even when we were starting the company, you break it down, you say, okay, well, we own the land, so we've got security capital there. We don't have any debt. We're 100% paid for. We don't have anyone looking over our shoulders. Our product is a proven product, coffee. I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Chocolate's not going anywhere anytime soon. Panama and Belize are both politically stable. You've got the same rights as a Panamanian or a Belizean to own land, so there's none of those risks there. Weather, because of the shape of the continent where Panama is, all the hurricanes pass us, so we don't get anything. Panama doesn't get hurricanes. It does get a lot of rain, but Boquete is at, as you saw, Lane, it's about a 45 degree or, or steeper slope, so unfortunately the rain just affects the people at the bottom of the hill. Um, global warming, it's not so much that the farms are getting warmer, it's that the seasons are changing a little bit. So we get a little bit of rain during the dry season and dry spells during the rainy season. So that's, that affects the nutrition system. So that's why we've got agronomists and biologists constantly analyzing, because if you didn't pay attention to that, you could lose your crop. So that's a threat. So having, uh, having the proper staff and analyzing soil, doing leaf analysis, uh, collecting all the rainfall, doing all that stuff is how you can plan against that and mitigate against it. And then disease. So you've got, if I was you guys, so, so none, of these, none of these questions have really been coffee related yet. So you should have a look and see, do some research on what is specialty coffee. Go to the Specialty Coffee Association of America website or it's SCA and find out, do some research what actually specialty coffee is. Like how, what, what makes it specialty coffee because that's key to the whole thing. And then do your own bit of research about funguses. There's one called uh, Rosia, which is a, a, one of the main threats, and a beetle called Borca. And I could go on for 20 minutes about this, but if you, go, if, you have an, if you have a poorly managed farm, it can get sick. So if you read, you're going to read stories about farms in Guatemala and Honduras that lost 70% of production to Rosia. A lot of the mitigating factors are they were all smallhold farmers, maybe an acre each, they overplanted their farms. They had 6,000 trees per hectare when we only put about 3,500 or 4,000. When you have too many trees, they're competing for all the same nutrients. The sun can't get down to the roots. The wind can't pass through. And that's the perfect breeding ground for fungus. And then if your staff can't see in at the bottom of the tree, you don't notice that it's there until it's too late. And then it's like wildfire and you're wiped out. So planting smarter, having a more sustainable practice, and having young, healthy trees, because the trees are like us, they have an immune system. Um, if you let them get to 40 years old and they're not getting the right nutrients, they're gonna get sick. So we never let our trees get past the, well, when we have our systems in place, we won't let our trees go past kind of 15, 16, 17, 18 years, because coffee's like everything, like in life, it's a C curve. You plant it, we talked about getting your three years to the first crop, then you get kind of 12 to 15 years of high production and it starts to level off and then it starts to come down again. You get to the stage where your inputs are going to exceed your outputs and it's time to rotate the trees. So I'm kind of deviating here a little bit, but this is a big question that we get a lot about how do we keep the farms going in perpetuity? So once you get to start dipping on the farms, we'll have a plan in place to rotate out 10, 15% of the trees on each farm every year. So you go in, you cut the tree down at the root, at the, the stump, and that same root ball will give you another coffee tree in two years instead of three. And then you get the same 15, 16, 17, 18 years. Do it again. So you've got three times 15. You've got 45 years out of that. At that stage, if the root ball, we'll, we'll test it. If the root ball is not healthy enough and strong enough to give us a healthy coffee tree and good enough coffee, we'll, let it, we'll make a plan in advance to let it die. So what we do is in the meantime, we plant baby saplings in the rows in between these older trees so they grow in the shade of the older trees that are protected and when they're at year two you cut down all the older trees you pull away all the new leaves to try and sprout and the tree the roots just decompose back into the soil and then you've got a whole new section renovated and you get another 45 years and the cost of doing that is practically nothing the labor is a sunk cost because it's our team we do it in between harvest seasons so they're they're on the payroll anyway the seeds come from our trees the soil, we might have to buy a little bit of soil and some bags, but, but that's about it. So keeping those young, healthy trees, having an agronomist and biologist monitoring soil, rainfall, watching for fungus, watching for beetles, um, all that kind of stuff mitigates against 
the Roja and the Bulks. Yeah, and if you, guys, if you guys want to geek out more on that in the video, um, I think David's kind of talking about that in the field. It's kind of fascinating how, how the whole discussion with the C curves are. Um, it's kind of like apartments, right? Like we don't buy, when we try and stay in this 1980s realm of class C apartments, put in some cap X, some nice lipstick on a pig, get, you know, get another five, 10 years of value out of that asset. But after a while, you can't really do anything. So it's kind of like, you know, Darren's got like this big stump of a coffee plant that's not really performing. He just kills the thing. Um, yeah. Whereas the apartment, you'd sell it when it gets too old. You know, like a 1970s apartment today, that's just a little bit too old, which is one of the reasons why we don't keep that stuff forever. You know, to buy and never sell is not really the best policy. Yeah, so the good thing about agriculture as, regard, as against uh, traditional real estate Traditional real estate, your, the most important thing is your market, right? So what's the market that I'm going to buy the real estate in? Is it solely dependent on one big employer? If the employer leaves, are my tenants going to have a job? Are they going to leave? Da, da, da. With coffee, you've got trees and you can rotate them very quickly. They don't complain. <laughs> you just cut them down and, and swap them out. And you can sell their product into any market anywhere in the world, wherever the demand is. If, if, if we want to sell our coffee into China, if it wants to go to the US or Europe, wherever it's going to be, we have the freedom of planting it where the conditions are right and selling it into, I suppose, any currency and any, and any market that we want. So it gives you that freedom. Right. And I put this slide up, the cash crop versus specialty coffee, because it took me like one day in Panama to realize that you guys weren't a cash crop operation. Yeah, I didn't difference. know why I didn't know that, but I didn't know that. Yeah. Down, down to the down to the things of like you could fit. You can understand how the the commercial coffee farmers think about it. If I can fit six thousand coffee trees on my acre, on my hectare, that's going to give me more coffee. So that must be better, right? But they don't realize as the trees start overgrowing each other, they produce. They give you less coffee. So if you just look after the trees, give them more space, we plant them one meter apart and three meters between each row, so they've got space to grow. And the more space they got to grow, the more branches. The more branches, the more coffee. So it's the, the big difference between us and the people we buy the farms from is we run the farms like a business. They just inherited farms and took what nature gave them. So you had a, a question here um, about sharing the audited financials. So they're not allowed to do that, right? Yeah, well, David put it in from the start that there is no order to financials. So especially at the start when there wasn't much, there was no coffee anyway. But as a small company, audits down here, time consuming and expensive. So there will be third party accounting review with an opinion letter. But as of now, there's no plan to do audits. Okay. So let's kind of get into the, you know, how do you guys calculate the returns and the IRRs? You know, first, like what were the big assumptions you guys had? Like for apartments, it's... Um, occupancy, 90% occupancy, that these are going to be the rents. What are the big inputs for this coffee? So I kind of ruined the magic a little bit when we do this, but it's pretty easy. We know scientifically how many, well, we know exactly how many trees we're going to have per hectare because, well, we plant them, right? So we know exactly how many trees we have on every farm. We know how much coffee you can get per tree because it's proven scientifically and it's also proven by experience in Boquete. So all the coffee in Boquete is sold um, through auction. It's all public knowledge. So everybody knows Andres and his team have been in the industry. So we know how much coffee we can get per tree. We know how many trees we have. So you can get the volume within 90%, right? So there's no magic there. We know from experience and from data how much it costs per square meter to operate a coffee farm and how much it costs per square meter to create a coffee farm from scratch so we know the expenses if you, you go to a builder in your area lane and ask him how much does it cost per square meter to build a building he'll tell you off the top of his head the rough price per square meter from experience right so we've got the same data we know how much the the, the expenses are we adjust a little bit for inflation obviously um, so the only main variable was the sale price so if you look at the top line and the full form, it's how much we predict the coffee will sell for. And it goes up, I think, 40, 50 cents per year, starting at $2, and it goes up and up. By year 20, it gets to about $11. Now, 20 years is a long time away. Um, there's people selling coffee from similar farms to us, same altitude, same microclimates. They're selling their coffee for 5 to 10 to 11 $12 a pound now. 
So it's not that we're predicting that suddenly we're going to change the game and we're going to, especially coffee sells from here and we're going to sell it for here. We're just taking our time to get our farms up to what our neighbors are already doing now. And that was all public knowledge. So there's no real magic in there. We, we know how much the coffee sells for. We took the lowest average. Obviously, the sales price is an average. As we talked about, you could have five micro lots per farm. Or sorry, five varietals per farm, different, mi different microclimates, and then all processed different ways. So there's no way you're going to put 15 different sales prices in your, in your pro forma. So everything's an average, but we can get, we, we take the lowest base case because we always prefer to under promise and over deliver. Um, but that's it. They're your main variables. We know the expenses. Um, we know how much coffee we're going to have because we, we can calculate it from the trees. Um, and then just the sales price we took, what coffee is selling for now. So that's pretty much it. What's the um, price you're using for that base cost, like the price per pound right now, today? For in this year, I think it's in the pro form, it's about $3 a pound. And we've sold, okay, we, there was three or four different sales prices, but we sold some coffee for about $3.10, some for about two eighty. So in around, so we're about, we're, we're usually within 90% of volume and sales price each year. So what is uh what does cash crop coffee go for just to get a sense? This I haven't looked at the sea market in a couple of weeks, but I'd imagine a dollar twenty or something like that. But that's your that's your commercial coffee that's manipulated by people like Brazil sitting on their store on their store to drive price up. It's manipulated. It's like a lot of the stuff and there's future trading and all that involved in it. So the specialty coffee is purely supply and demand driven. All the specialty coffee around the world is sold out every single year. So, and there's an increase in demand, low supply. Most of it is sold at auction. So it's, it's a free market. It's how it should be. So your average coffee, we're still selling coffee from the trees that we inherited. Um, and it's selling for around $280 to $3 a pound versus $1.20 on the sea market. So, and that's with the old trees. So when we get our full production of the baby saplings that we planted, um, we should easily be able to get to four or five dollars a pound. And even if we only ever got to five or six dollars a pound in perpetuity, you'd be looking at double digit returns anyway. And it's important to know we don't include geisha in any of those pro formas. So we have geisha now that could easily sell for 20, 30 dollars a pound, but we only have a few pounds of it. But we planted 50,000 geisha coffee saplings last year. So I could easily make the, David could easily make the IRR look a lot more attractive and boost sales if we were that kind of a company by putting Geisha in there. But again, it's not how we want to do it. So Geisha is fussy. It's going to take some time to produce. So we would rather that just be a cherry on top and, and have happy parcel owners when that comes in. So next question here, um, the deeding process again, we, um, we kind of talked about this um, a little earlier, but it's in progress. And um, I think that's another reason why to kind of get in now because it sounds like Darren's kind of, uh, you know, covering some well, of those thing, costs. <laughs> well, well, we're covering for you and all the rest of the people. <laughs> the people before. If you I think, if you I, think I paid 15 or 14,000 back then. Yeah, so you paid, yeah, you paid 15. So we're going we're gonna to more than likely have to set up a Panamanian corporation for you, and we're going to foot the bill for that. Thank um, you. But any, anyone that comes in from now on, um, it's just going to be a, it's a, it's a cost of doing business. If you want to use an entity, you're going to have to set up a corporation. If you don't want to set up a corporation, you just buy in your own name. If you own a parcel, anyone that owns a parcel in their own name, it's, it's straightforward. There's no problem, no extra cost. Um, or if you have a Panamanian corporation or entity already, um, but it's just, it's something to take into consideration. If you are going to use an entity, there will be an additional cost of fourteen fifty. Uh, so the, everybody likes to get a deal here. The question is, oh, do we get a discount for go coming in as a simple passive cash flow member? And well, the, the answer is you're already getting a deal. Um, maybe kind of go over the, the pricing. So the, how it currently is. I've gotten them. Um, maybe 12 or 13 email conversations where you've introduced me to people over the last maybe what, four or five weeks. Um, and one of the reasons that I wanted to do this, convert, this, this call and to get to meet some of you guys was it seemed to be the first question off everyone's lip was what about the discount? And straight away I'm thinking, I don't, I don't think this is the right deal for you. If there's, there's so many other questions you should be asking me about, about specialty coffee, about the market, about the, about the, 
with all the stuff that we've covered now, that the disc, if the discount is your go or no go decision, then this is not for you. And, and we, we would probably tell you no, that, that you're, there's no parcels available for you if your main decision is based on getting a few hundred bucks off as a discount. So we did do a discount with your group, was it a year ago? And we gave everyone 5% off because everyone came in together and you brought maybe 10 or 12 people to the table. The reality was from the time the first deal closed until the last deal closed was six months. So the whole idea of giving a discount, if someone buys three parcels, you get a discount because it's less work for us. One person, one contract, one deed, one person to communicate with, one, per, one bit of administration versus three people. So that's why you can give a discount. If you've got 12 people coming in through now, there are going to be all 12 individual deals. So it's the exact same amount of legwork. So there's just no, um, there's no discount in there. And look, without being funny, if, if we come off the end of this call and none of you guys buy a parcel, the farm is still going to sell out by itself at full price over the next few weeks anyway. So forget, I would say forget about the discounts. It shouldn't be uh, a decision maker, maker for you. Look and see if you're comfortable enough with owning something offshore if you're comfortable enough with us, if you're comfortable enough with the, with the price and with the time that it's going to take for the coffee to produce. And if you're comfortable with all those things, um, we can have individual conversations again just to go through it a bit more and see what your own investment needs are. What is it that you're looking to get out of this? Uh, but the discount should be the last thing on your mind. Right. And, and the admin work is definitely a big part of this too. I think when we were when I was wearing you the money the last time, I don't know if you're still doing it yourself personally anymore, but yep. yeah, I still do. It's, it's just difficult wiring money internationally. You got to make sure you, you handwrite it very properly and get all your numbers the right way. Yeah, there's a lot. We've got, like when I, I, we were just doing stuff here this morning, but making sure that the problem is not the, the buyer or us or even the banks. It's the third party institution that's sending the money. And just trying to make sure that they enter the information correctly and that the wire doesn't get bounced and they send it to the right place and all that stuff. There's a lot of back and forth, but that's only the first part. We're going to be in a 20 year relationship with each other and we're going to be asking, we're going to be getting your deeds, going to be asking your questions, answering your questions about the performance of the farm, getting you down here on farm tours. This is just the start. So the relationship with those, all those people over those years is the administration and all the deeding and stuff that comes into it. So. Yeah. And, and Darren sends out, I don't know if it's what quarterly, but I don't really read them anymore. They're kind of long. They're a little <laughs> bit too much, too much information <laughs> in my opinion, but I don't know. I, I went on a tour and I saw enough and you know, let you guys do your own thing. <laughs> but if you guys yeah, like so to read, right, like to read a lot of emails, you'll, you'll get. You know, on yeah. The so the idea with, if you're put show of hands here, anybody, how many people on this call have gotten a sales call from me? Nobody, right? So we don't call people. We don't sell anything. We don't, I've got a team built here. They're going to be selling coffee and chocolate. They're not going to be calling people, trying to sell them anything. The deal pretty much sells itself. We send out loads of newsletters. You can unsubscribe anytime you want. One in 10 might be a salesy newsletter. The rest of them is telling you all about what goes on on the farm. And there's a lot that goes into it. If you're looking to invest in an offshore com country, an offshore corporation we believe that there's a you should have a lot of information to make your decision based on so lane you can just follow the facebook videos they're on, they're nice and short oh i don't i'm don't, not really on social media much <laughs> but um yeah so kind of nearing up to the going a little bit an hour um we'll open it up for questions i got one um somebody typed it in here Will there be an equal number percentage of geisha trees planted on each farm since that will be likely impact the return? No. So the return you're looking at um, doesn't have any geisha included, like we said. Um, it's, there's no set plan for, for You can't just say we're going to plant 50,000 geisha on every farm because not every farm has the altitude, the soil, the shade cover, the microclimates. It's about analyzing each farm and what's the best coffee to go into each farm. Now, Everybody, one of the reasons we don't talk about Geisha that much and it's not in the financials is that's once people hear it, that's all they want to know. There's a direct, there is a direct correlation between the altitude and the quality of the coffee. So at the start, we always wanted the highest altitude farm possible. Everyone wanted to be in the highest altitude farm. But every time you go up every 100 meters, you get higher quality coffee, but you also get a lower production. So we've got farms that are down at 1500 meters that could have twice the volume of coffee as the farm at 1,800 meters and 2,000 meters. And the cash 
at the end of the year could be the same because it has an excellent coffee, especially coffee. It's really, really good. And there's more of it. So don't get too hung up on exactly what varietals are in each farm. Or again, I wouldn't base your decision on that. Most of the farms are going to probably factor out pretty similar because we've got a fairly tight range of farms that we buy. Um, and they all have similar varietals processed different ways. So everyone wants a full geisha farm. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Yeah, and, and you guys take the tour out there. It's kind of neat. Like you walk, um, you know, a thousand meters one way and it's, it feels a little different. A thousand meters yeah. the other way, you know, the climate just changes. So that's what he's kind of yeah. talking about there. You'll be, you'll be in the hotel. You'll think, man, it's lashing rain. We're going to get soaked. And you get to the farm and sun's shining. And it's only 15 minutes away. So if you guys want to take yourself off mute, go ahead and ask any questions you have. But um, type it Everybody's still them. sleepy. They are. So, well, um, hey, Darren, is it okay if I put this up on the website? or? Sure, yeah. Up? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Go I don't ahead. think we talk too much about financials. And no, that. no, 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 no. It's fine. It's it's good for everybody to get a good introduction into it. There's for everybody, whether it's the people on this call or anybody that listens to this afterwards. Go to the Agronosotros website if you haven't already got it. Sign up for the newsletters in the in the land ownership section. You'll get three newsletters or three introduction emails. First one tells about what we do, and you get an FAQ. Second one goes in a bit more detail and has some podcasts. Podcasts are a great way to learn about it. David's been on podcasts for the last five years with, with webinars with you, Lane, or on with the real estate guys, Get Rich Education, Wealth Formula. He just did one with Ori Tipster, um, with Seth. So have a listen to the podcast when you're driving to work, and you'll probably pick up more about what we do than from reading my long emails. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, go to the land ownership section. Do the online fillable NDA. We've made it as easy as possible. And once you've done that, you'll get access to the members area. And in there, you'll have some additional reports. You'll be able to see the ownership agreements, the purchase agreements, and the financial projections, as well as some client testimonials and some stuff like that in there. So have a look and see if the numbers make sense for you. Um, the ownership and purchase agreements are very simple. The purchase agreement is two pages. Ownership agreement is four or five. The only term really, there's a three year no sale policy and we've got 30 days for a right of refusal. Apart from that, there's nothing really too onerous in there. Um, oh, and, and you, can't, you can't compete with a, a coffee farm south in Central America against you guys. Uh, yeah, like, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're not allowed to come down here and set up Lane's coffee farm and subdivide right. parcels next door to us. Right, right. Somebody yeah. caught on to that one. A couple of people, yeah. Well, <laughs> I was going to say, fortunately or unfortunately, they weren't very successful. Um, which is unfortunate for their investors and unfortunate for us because it kind of tires everyone with a bad name. But they tried to do an aloe vera deal in Colombia using a similar model and unfortunately it didn't work out well. So, All right. so if you guys don't have any questions, um, we'll end this. Um, I always open, you know, shoot me an email if you got kind of side sidebar conversations or you want to kind of get my input on your situation. Always, um, always fine to do that for you guys. Um, but I would yeah, so say kind of get moving on this. Just keep moving forward on, you know, reviewing documents. And, you know, if you're interested, just keep moving forward. And, yeah, you know, like, look, it's, it's not that complicated a deal. But at the same time, it's not for everybody. Not everybody is comfortable with doing something. I'd, I'd say 90% of our, 95% of our parcel owners bought sight unseen. And that's, that's a bigger number than we expected when we started. So it's not for everybody. If you need to come down and do a farm tour first, you're more than welcome, whether it's on a group tour or a private tour. We've got three coffee farm tours every year, three cacao farm tours every year, and we do private tours in between. So um, talk to Lane. He's been down here. Um, listen to the podcasts. Go to the website. And just shoot me an email as well if you want. Any questions you have, we can set up a personal call and we can discuss your own personal situation. Yeah. and Maybe we'll do a, a chocolate tour in Belize this year. Yeah, for okay. sure did the coffee one last year and for sure we will bring other Good people idea. along too if you guys Good are interested idea. in that let me know but um all right well thanks for joining everybody i'll talk to you guys later yeah all right guys have a good day lane i'll talk to you soon all right see ya take it easy